Vicki, thank you for coming back to Traverse City. We're so glad to have you. I'm glad to be back. You know, uh, I was supposed to come, I think, earlier. Yes. <laughs> I, I forget thing. And you know, nobody ever says it, but, but what it was is I had breast cancer. And, uh, you know, it's small, and so we caught it, um, like, uh, what do you call it, early stages. And uh, my, my surgeon, who was a good surgeon, uh, Jolene, said, you know, well, she could treat the, the cancer or she could take the breast off. I, I'm 74 years old. What the hell am I going to do with another breast? So, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, take it off. And so, uh, actually, nobody can tell which one is missing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that's well, why, I, I, I don't know why they didn't just say, you know, well, she's, she's uh, I'm not being treated for breast cancer because it's gone, but uh, I do have this pill and it makes you sleepy, but I'm not going to, at least I hope, <laughs> but if I fall asleep, <laughs> you, you'll know it's just because I had you'll this, be awake. This, this, this pill, be awake. you know, tonight, yeah, but <laughs> I'm so, glad to be back. That's a long way to say thank you for it. <laughs> So I'm remembering when you were here before, somebody, uh, let's see, the, the person who interviewed you asked you um, about your next book and you said, well, I'm already slipping notes in a folder. And so I was wondering, are you know most of these poems from what got slipped in the, is that the way you work? Um, tell you the truth, I don't remember what I was slipping <laughs> into a folder, but uh, I'm, I'm a jazz, I do listen to jazz and I finished, um, a good cry, and, and I was very pleased with a good cry, and I had to be, I live up in, in the mountains, I live up in, in Blacksburg, and I was down in Roanoke, and I was listening to, I listened to jazz, and I was listening to jazz, and there's a, a, a jazz piece, it's really nice, it's not great, it's just a nice piece, it's called Make Me Rain, and I was kind of listening to what's going around, and I had a couple of lines, and I said, oh, when I go home, I need to write this down, and then I remembered, um, then it, that's a whole other thing about my, my health, I mean, this would be a sad story if I'm not careful, but I had, a, <laughs> no, I had a seizure, and so, you know, you forget things. I didn't have a stroke, as you can see, but I had a seizure, and so I forget things, and I don't know if I forget things because I don't care. I know a lot of things I don't care, and so I do forget for that reason. <laughs> That's the truth, but other things I didn't. I thought, no, I better pull over, so I pulled over to the side of the road, and I wrote this poem, Make Me Rain. And then I realized, oh, I've got the next book going. I have 50 poems in that book right now. <laughs> the next one. So I don't know if that's how I write or just because. Uh, it's, it's been interesting, writing Make Me Rain has been interesting because a good cry is, I was about to say was, but I, I think it still is, uh, it, it's emotional. And a lot of what's in a good cry is probably more uh, emotional than I normally Am. I'm normally, um, I think things through, but this is really, um, I think, emotional. And so I think about a good cry, and uh, I think about some of the poems in, in A Good Cry, and they're, they're closer to my heart. And then I'm, I'm usually, uh, I was about to say share, but I don't know. You know, somebody said, you know, buy her a book. You know, hell, I don't care if you buy the book or not. <laughs> you know, and I, I, uh, and I don't mean to say it like that, but I don't, because. Uh, <laughs> Well, if, if you cared about people buying books, then, you know, then I'd be, I may as well stand on a corner. <laughs> I bet you I could make more money. And so, <laughs> you know, you just don't want, and, and, and I know that they didn't mean it like that. They were just trying to say something nice, but I don't like to think about I write a book because somebody's going to buy it, because I, I don't and I don't. But this book became emotional to me because um, Mommy died 10 years ago, but in, in mommy's death, mommy died in June, my sister Gary died in July, uh, my aunt Ann died in October, and my dog Wendy died in December. So it went like that. And for those of us who have had a bunch of deaths to go through, and I'm really trying not to use death. I think death is a bad word now. I think the term I prefer actually is a transition. And so these transitions, but you have to do things. Your mother dies, and you know your sister's dying, so you're thinking, okay, I got a, a car, I have two cars to take, you know. You got things to do, ba boom ba boom ba boom and so you don't have time to sit down and cry. My, my doctor, thank God, is good looking, and Gregory, <laughs> it matters. I, I know people say it doesn't, but it does. <laughs> it matters. <laughs> it does. And, Gregory, Gregory says that 
one of the, the reason I had a seizure was that I didn't, uh, I, he says I eat too much salt. I'm a black woman, so of course I eat a lot of salt. <laughs> we all do. But I was saying to Gregory, I think that the reason that I had a seizure is that I didn't let things out. And I haven't let things out, period. I mean, it's not just that I didn't let things out when mommy died. I haven't let things out. Uh, my father and mother, and I was about to say used to fight, but they didn't fight. He used to hit her, and she used to be hit. And so that's not a fight. You know, it's like people, I mean, we're up here in Michigan, so people probably say, I go hunting, but you don't go hunting because a damn deer doesn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't. You got a gun and it doesn't. So, you know, don't, don't tell me. It's a, but that would be another discussion, wouldn't it? But you know, you know what I notice about this book is that so many of the poems are two people with praise, with, with kind of, you know, just they're warm and open. And, and so it's interesting that so many of them are written as celebrations of various people at the same time. The book is called A Good Cry, and that sort of alternates with that. Did you think about that when you were naming it, or are you putting it together? Well, actually, you know, the book was almost called Observances, because I observe. And I'm the baby sister. I was the baby sister. Now I'm the oldest person in the family. And that, some of you are probably in the same position. The strangest position, you start off being the baby, and then somebody passes, and somebody passes, and you look around, and you're the oldest person in the family, and people are calling you for advice, and you're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, you, know, you don't have anything. But I observe. I, I, um, I'm always observing. And um, even being here, there are things that I will forget because I'm not interested, but there will always, <laughs> it's fair, but there are also things that I have observed and that I will observe. And if I get, get an opportunity, I will write a Traverse Michigan poem because there are things that I see here that are, I think, um, for lack of a better word, interesting. So that's what you're... Uh, yeah. So if you put those, if you put a note, some notes in a folder or remember, whatever, and then how do you begin working with that material? I wouldn't put a note in the folder, I would remember. Yeah. And so that's what I... And if I don't remember, it's because I wasn't interested. <laughs> but uh, I, I, th there are things about being here uh, because you have a, a really nice reading group. And considering, in all fairness, and, and uh, I was about to say I mean no dis disrespect, but I do mean disrespect because I just like him so much. When you realize that that fool in the White House can't read, then you also know that. <laughs> well, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know he doesn't know how to read, because if he did, he wouldn't be that fool. But we've got, it, it's so nice to be in a city where reading is important, because reading is important. And I have a, a, a there are several people that I love a lot right now. I, I don't know why, but, but I really love uh, Dr. Bolden, who is the head of NASA. And if, <laughs> if Trump could read, he probably would have fired him, but he doesn't realize. <laughs> He probably doesn't realize that black guy is running NASA. And, <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't because he's prejudiced. He'd probably get rid of it. But Dr. Bolden and I are discussing what we have to do, what we need to do when we go into space. And of course, I'm a big fan of we need women. We definitely need women to go into space. There's no, no question. And in my opinion, we need black women because black women have had to be bothered with everybody. And we, we have, and, <laughs> but we found a way to, to love, and we found a way to, to, to take it forward. And he and I were discussing, well, we discussed a couple of things. Number one, and I know you guys think you make wine, but we have to, you, we, we cannot go into space without alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what alcohol do you want to take with you? Oh, I want wine, and I want, I want to find a way. I teach at Virginia Tech. And so I'm saying that tech has to find a way to um, make it, draw it In up, do, do something, to take. take the, so that we could add water to it or something. <laughs> what we don't have is, uh, we can't take the glass. We know we can't put it in a glass. We have to find something else to put it in. And we know that wine is important. You might say, well, Nikki, why do we know that? We know that because what we talk about in, in terms of ex exploration, we talk about people like Columbus and them. And we know that Columbus and them came and finally made it to America. What we never talk about is the people that murdered each other before they came. And those are the people that murdered each other because they were crazy. They wanted sex and they wanted something to drink. And they didn't have. 
you can look it up. <laughs> it's true. And that's, that's why they, they killed each other and they didn't have anything to drink. And so finally people began to realize, oh, they need women and they need alcohol. What kind and, of food did they need? I don't know what they ate, but I know what they drank. <laughs> and that's, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling the truth. So we know that when we start to talk about space, we need alcohol and we need, well, you know you, know you need sex. Uh, well, now we're a little more, we're not as, as, uh, as, you don't need women to have sex anymore because now we're, <laughs> we're a little more open-minded, right? So, you know, you take a couple of guys now, but see, there was a time we wouldn't have taken a couple of guys or, you know, a couple of women. We wouldn't have admitted that, oh, yeah, they're going to have sex. So we wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get invited oh. back. But, no, but I mean, that's true that, that there was a time, yeah, if you just had some guys on the boat, they, they weren't going to be allowed to have sex. And so they were going to, of course, kill each other. And this is <laughs> sort of the situation we have. But now we do. But what we also need, and this is why I mentioned Dr. Bolden, because what we also need, and that's why I was, this is to get to here. What we also <laughs> need is what are we going to do to entertain ourselves, to keep ourselves, not just entertained, but to keep our hearts and minds open. You need poetry. And the reason you need poetry is that you can keep reading. My students and I are arguing about this. And they say, well, you need something else beside poetry. And I said, yeah, probably. It would probably be a couple of kids' books. If I were going into space, I would definitely want, and I, and I think I should do it, and I think that Dr. Bowden should allow me to do it, to do you know, poems for space. So I'd have that book. But then I would also like children's books, because one of my favorite books, period, on Earth, is Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Thank you. You know, you can just read it again because it's so lovely. You know, little Timothy has a cold and she's going to have to go and, and, and meet everybody in order to make that happen. And my other favorite book is The Crossover by, by my former student, uh, uh, Kwame Alexander, because I, you can, yeah, isn't that a wonderful book? And you can just read that over and over again. So I think that, you know, you need a couple of books that you can take and I just, well, I wouldn't you've written take written 10 children's books. I've right? written a couple. And uh, you also won the Caldecott Prize for Rosa. I did. I mean, it's not like you haven't made a huge contribution to children's uh, books. Well, that's nice, but I don't, I don't think you could take Rosa uh, up in space. I think you could take I Am Loved, because this is a book I did with, uh, I don't know if you have it or whatever, but I Am Loved I did with Ashley Bryant. And Ashley called me. Ashley's 94. He's so lovely. You have and a poem? for Ashley. Oh, I have a lot of points. I, I love Ashley so much. And Ashley called me and said, we ought to do a book together. Well, who wouldn't want to do a book <laughs> with Ashley? And I said, Ashley, I would love to do a book. And I didn't have a name for it. I just had some poems. And he said, well, why don't you write some poems? So I wrote some poems and I sent it to him. So he got to pick the poems that were in here that he wanted to, um, that he wanted to illustrate. So I can take this because they're different poems. Do you see what I'm saying? But you have to be careful about what you take into space because you're not going to get a chance to take something else. <laughs> you're going to have to, well, you know what I'm saying? You have to keep reading the same things. But as you grow older, and I think growing old is a good idea, by the way. Um, no, we talk about it like, ooh, you're getting old. Well, of course yeah. you're getting old. What's the alternative? Yeah. Well, the alternative in America is you went to school and you got killed. Because some fool came in and shot you, and, and the damn president and people won't, won't turn around and say, we shouldn't let you have a gun. Right? This is right. so easy. Right. right. This, this right. is so easy. Right. That's the truth. That's the truth. You have some of the most interesting things to say about education. I, I think it's in that prose piece called, um, uh, the, the tassel is worth the hassle. <laughs> Yeah, I do Can have you a talk poem. about that a little bit? Oh, God, I, <laughs> I hate to say I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> I don't remember a lot of my poems. I know I wrote that. You did? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, you don't have to read it, but I mean... Oh, thanks, because it's long. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, but I just wondered if you'd like to talk about some of your ideas about education. I think education's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of people are stupid. I think that... Um, 
Well, you know that you all go on. Well, you said you were talking about a, a cooperative way to get older people to come in and provide oh. food, and then you were talking about of going course. only to the tenth grade. And, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Now I remember. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of my problems is I don't have. Rem if any of you write, let me do this, because this is true. If any of you write, or any of you have children, the right grandchildren, the right something like that, discourage them from remembering it. Let them write it, and then let them go and write something else. Because if you're not careful, what you'll do is you'll be afraid of making a mistake or of contradicting yourself. And you shouldn't worry about that. Because if, 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 there isn't one, if there's one thing you should do as a writer is that you should eventually contradict yourself. If you don't, it means you haven't grown. And you've got to grow. If you don't grow, it means you're stupid. And so we, we discourage that. You, am I mm -hmm. making? Yeah. And what I wanted, because I live in a small town up in the mountain, and I see a lot of older people who don't have anything to do. And that's what, that's what started that. When you said that, it, it reminded me. It was such a me. great idea. And I think, yeah, I think that, that we should go and pick up those people and take them to school and let them sit and have lunch, have breakfast, actually, with our students. And I think that we should have breakfast for our students because a lot of our students, I live in, I live in, in, in uh, South, South uh, West Virginia, a lot of our students come to school hungry. And there's no reason that we don't feed the kids. Somebody said, well, we can't afford it. Well, money is made. You, you just, you make it and you, you roll it and you make it in the... <laughs> That's what you do. And we've got billionaires, so what do we do with that? Billionaires buy and sell people. That's a bad idea. We need to tax them. We do. And I would love to see the older people coming to school and sitting with them. Everybody says, because the kids are getting bullied. You know, the, the one story that I absolutely, positively hate, and I'm, uh, and I'm hoping to work on a book, but that will be another discussion in a minute. One thing I hate is but Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I think that it should be outlawed. I think it's the dumbest damn thing you ever heard of because <laughs> it teaches everybody to be bully. It does. They laughed because he had a very funny note. They laughed at him. They wouldn't let him play in any games until Santa Claus, one foggy evening, you guys get far, Santa Claus needed something. And then he comes and says, Rudolph, you know, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh? And Rudolph should have told him to kiss my red nose. <laughs> he should have. Yeah. Absolutely. They, they saw, they saw Rudolph. They saw that they were laughing at him. They saw that he was all alone. But didn't we call him Joe Lewis? when America, in segregation, didn't allow black people to walk through this door or sit at, or drink from this, this fountain? Or didn't we call it Jesse Owens when we needed, when, when the white people yeah. who said they're superior needed somebody to run and win some gold things for them, some gold medals? Didn't we call the black people to come and do that? And you get sick of that crap. And that's what Rudolph teaches them. It teaches them that, yeah, you can do anything you want to do to somebody until you need something. And then you ask them, and then they're supposed to be incredibly happy that, 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 that you've allowed that to happen. I hate Rudolph the Red Nose. You, <laughs> you know what struck me? Um, you were talking about, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, I, I think it's in Baby West, it, it's, uh, you were talking about your grandmother, and you were talking about how you used to clean her house for her. And, and I want you, to, in a few minutes, I want you to talk about the business of writing because you have some really interesting things to say about your history, the business of writing. But what struck me is that you were cleaning your grandmother's house because she was having her bridge club there. And she was having her bridge club there because black people couldn't go out and, have, and meet anywhere else. They had to meet in people's homes. We did. And there's, there, for those of us who know our blues, you know, there is a, there's a house party way across town. People coming from miles around, put on your pretty red dress. And the reason we had the house party way across town was that there was no place else for, for black people to go. And if you recall, 
all of us who know Nat King Cole, and I'm a big Nat King Cole fan, Nat King Cole is in Alabama on stage singing, and some white boys who say that they're superior but couldn't put three words together are coming on stage and beating him up. So you get sick of that, you know what I'm, well, we don't do much of that anymore. Now the white boys just come into schools and shoot people down. And you really do, you really do wonder why somebody is reading the Second Amendment in that way. I know that the reason that, uh, uh, that fool, uh, Trump reads it that way is that he can't read, but the rest of us, because th that's not what the Second Amendment says. And, and all you have to do is look at it to know that. And I think things like that should stop. I think that, first of all, it, it's time that race, and again, I'm 74, so if you had asked me this when I was 24, we could have a discussion about race, and white people and black people at yakety yak. But at 74, I know that whatever it is that we are, we are earthlings. We are on this planet together. And whatever it is about this planet, and it's fascinating to me, is that I, I, it, it's illogical that there is no other life in the space. We call it outer space, and we look, think of it as looking up, or we think of it as looking down. We don't have any idea which way space actually is. <laughs> we don't, but we do know that there has to be life because it's illogical that in whatever it is, we are the only life. That would be, well, one, it would be stupid, and two, we're not gonna survive. If we are all that life is, it's, it's time for us, and we are. We're, we're, we're checking out. You can see that. It, 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 uh, it, we're, we're having bad weather. We're killing each other. A lot of craziness yeah. is going on. Yeah. It's, it's going to stop. And so somehow or another, we have to realize we are earthlings. And as we go into space or whatever space is, as we go, somebody's going to say, something will say, and where are you from? Well, you can't say, you no, know, you can't say I'm from Michigan. Nobody understands that at all. And you can't, I'm not picking on Michigan, just wouldn't make sense. You can't say I'm from the United States because that's even, it doesn't make any sense. You're going to have to say, actually, I'm from Earth. I'm from third planet, from the yellow sun, in order to make any sense. And they're going to say, I'm from the fifth planet, from whatever. We are Earthlings, and it's time that we started to treat people like that because we, it started, that we started to, to, to teach people that, because the rest of it isn't gonna make any sense. Sex doesn't make any sense, and I mean, men and women don't make any sense, because you, if you are or you aren't, that's up to you. Yeah. It really is, it's nobody else's business. And people are always mad, oh, I don't think, you know, the gay people ought to get married. Well, then don't marry them. <laughs> that, that, that's really easy, <laughs> you know. So you, you get sick of that, because that belonged to another century. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah, of, I'm sure. not cutting you off. No. But that belonged to another century. That whole idea of men and women was another century. That was just a way of, yeah. of, of recreating life. I think that human female ought to learn, and I think she really should, how to lay an egg. Because <laughs> I do. If we can learn to lay an egg, then, then we could figure out what we wanted to uh, 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 fertilize, yeah. and then we could prevent fertilizing such things as Trump or, you know, because you see that, oh, that's a fool, and just stir that up and, and fry it, and so your dog eat it, you see okay. what I'm saying? I have a question. <laughs> so you go, you go to space, and, and as representative, is there a poem in this collection that you could take and that would feel like it represented what you would like to have represented from Earth? Probably not, but <laughs> the poem that I, I, I love a couple of poems in this, uh, in well, this book. Good. And one of them, uh, I was trying to think when you said that, if I took a poem to read, I would took the poem I married my mother. Because- uh, I love that poem. Yeah, I love that poem, yeah. thank you, I, yeah. I should. But if, if I may, read it, if yeah. I, uh, I, I'm going to read that if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. But if I took, because the one thing that I wanted, thank you, in the first, no, thank you, in the first, I don't usually have any control over my books. I send them off, Rachel does it, because she's my editor, that's what she's supposed to do. And the only thing I said to Rachel was that 
this had to be the first poem. This was, it, it's called Heritage. And it, it finally occurred to me, not finally, but it occurred to me that no matter how we look at humans, we are never finished. So if right now we died, all of us, we just recently found, as you know, uh, the, the Mayan empire. And it's so fascinating. And we're up in space, and we looked, and we finally found that there was a Mayan empire, which everybody knew it had to be there anyway, because you read books and you daydream. If all of us are, we would evolve and evolve, or dissolve, I guess would be the term. And eventually, we would not be anything. But eventually, beyond that nothing, something's going to come up. Does that make sense? That was a bad sentence, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Eventually, something's going to come up. Where we used to be, where it used to be us, now a flower is going to come up, or a seed is going to come up, or a weed is going to come up. But something is going to come up. And in, in my opinion, whatever it is that comes, whatever life form that comes, somebody or some life form is going to run into it. Now, I happen to like, for example, diamonds. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a poor woman. My, my, my family didn't have any money. And so you'll see the, these are rings that my mother gave me for my 40th birthday, and they're really nice. They're little diamonds. And in giving them to me, Mommy knows that I like diamonds, but she picked these diamonds for some reason. She stood in the jewelry store, and something spoke to her, but these used to be something else. They used to be somebody. Somebody was buried. And a thousand years, however long it was, it dissolved, dissolved, dissolved. And somebody found it, and it was a stone. And somebody said, oh, what a nice stone. Let's polish it. And they polished it, and it became this. And when my mother saw it, she saw the love that somebody a thousand years ago put in the ground. Does that make you? And I think it's so important that we think about the love that we have around us, whether it's a stone, whether it's a, 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 a tree, no matter what it is. There's, I wrote a poem for, for my good friend, and I loved him so much, Walter uh, Leonard. And Betty is his wife. Betty called me and she said, I'm, uh, Walter is just not gonna, he's not gonna make it. And she had to put him in a, a home because she couldn't take care of him anymore. And eventually, of course, we know that, well, Walter's now passed, we buried Walter, and, and it was very sad. The, the sad part about losing people, I think, is not the people who go, because I'm becoming convinced that the transition is not that you and I are sad that we're leaving, but that the people that we're leaving are sad that we're going, and that, that's where it is. And so in, 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 in dealing with this, I wanted to, think about who would run into Walter and, and, and where. I won't be here. My granddaughter, who's 12, won't be here. Her granddaughter won't be here. But somebody will run into a stone or something one day, and it will be Walter. And they'll look and say, oh, that's, I like this. And they'll take it home. As you and I may have picked up a rock out of the, you know, we walk on the, you walk here on, on the, uh, Lake Michigan, and you see something. And you think, wow, I like that. And you don't know why you like it. It used to be somebody that somebody loved. And that's what I wanted to say in this point. The folk here are old. There are wheelchairs and people struggling to push them. There are sad-eyed people looking up from beds they cannot stretch out, out in. And some simply cannot move their heads. All will become something precious, sapphires, emeralds, rubies, which will be discovered by other explorers who will polish and shape the stones, and we will wear them, never knowing whose loved one we have embraced. Thank you. I, I love that so much. But I used to say to my mother all the time um, that, that she should have married me. And she would laugh, and she would say, well, baby, if I hadn't married you, how would, how would, how would I get you? You know, we, we couldn't have you. And I said, well, that's what we'd have to, we'd have to figure out. And <laughs> it's true, because it something uh, to do with eggs. I, I didn't like the fact that mom, and I didn't understand, I still don't, I, I don't understand why people hit people that they love. So I, that just strikes me as odd. And so 
I wrote a poem because I did. When my father, my mother called me, Gus, we called my father, I called him Gus, we called him Gus, and Gus was sick. She, my mother called me, she said, uh, you know, Gus is in the hospital. Well, I knew she wouldn't call me because I cared, because I couldn't have cared less. I, she she should have called me to say he did, but he wasn't, but she called to say me. But I knew that she was calling because she obviously needed me. And my sister was living in Seattle, and I knew that, that Gary wasn't going to come home. So when I talked to Gary, and she said, well, you know, you all call me if you need something. <laughs> why, why would she call you if she didn't need something? So I went home. I had a little Volkswagen. I had a son, and I had a dog. And we moved to Cincinnati. And of course, ultimately, uh, it was fun. My father had, you know, he's, he's ill. And now he has to come home. He's going he's gonna to live for another year. And I love uh, Nothing made me as happy, I have to share that, as him being sick, because now, <laughs> Now he comes home, and now we're sitting, and I'm thinking about what do I want to, how do I want to handle this? So the first thing I want to do, of course, is I wanted to get out of his house because we were living in his house. So I said to mommy, we need to buy a house, and, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to buy a house. So mommy's like, okay. <laughs> so now we've moved Gus into my house. And we were having breakfast one morning, and he said something I didn't want to hear. And I said, Gus, you know, you have to be careful what you say to me. And so he's looking at me like, mm. And I said, you know, the chair you're sitting in is my chair. I just thought he should recognize that. <laughs> and so he's looking at me, and I, it's not going to suit him. And I said, the, the floor your chair is sitting on is it's my floor. And by that time, he's angry because I'm upset about some other thing. I said, you're about to get up and go into the bedroom, but the bedroom you're going into is my bedroom. And the bed you're going to lie down on is my bed. So let me share how you're going to live the rest of your life. <laughs> I just thought he might like to know. He said, you, <laughs> you're going to wake up every morning, and you're going to say to that woman who's married to you, I love you, honey. Thank you for breakfast. And you're going to smile. <laughs> and you're going to tell her that she looks good. And you're going to say something wonderful to her. You're going to find and. You don't have to, because I have some place that I'll send you that'll make you so sorry that you don't. And so I meant to, so for the rest, because I remembered him hitting her. You don't forget anything, do you? I said, no, damn it, I don't. And I'm going to make sure that you do. And for the rest of his life, which wasn't that long, he woke up every morning. And, Good morning, honey, because that's what he's supposed to do. She said, you know, Gus has changed, hasn't he? Damn right he has. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> oh, no. No. One of the best things I did was buy that house. I didn't cry, and that's what we started. That's what this book started. I never did cry, and so I wrote this poem. And it's can I read the poem? Because it's a weird poem, yeah. I think, in a way. But I married my mother. I know crying is a skill. I automatically wipe my eyes, even though I know crying is a skill. Maybe I will learn. My mother did when she thought I was asleep. I think my sister did, sleep, but sleep is as difficult to me as crying. I laugh easily and I smile and withhold any true feelings, except once I fell in love with my eighth grade teacher and spent most of my life trying to feel safe again, though maybe I'm safe now, after almost 30 years, which is as long as I lived with my mother. Maybe that's not a poem. Maybe that's something else. Maybe I just wanted to show my father that he needn't be cruel. Maybe I just enjoyed buying the house he had to live in, showing her she should have married me instead of him. Or maybe, since we will all soon be gone, I should be happy I found my mother and someone else who loves me. What else really matters? I love that. So, yeah. so Nikki, <clears throat> what kind of truth does a poem tell that's different from the kind of truth a story? We were talking earlier about narrative. Everything is a narrative. Right. So, what is it about a poem? Why are poems? Why are so, they so important? I think poems are important because. Poems are like, uh, and, and I mentioned my eighth grade teacher, by the way. She, she was a nun, by the way, sister out there. And uh, no, I just loved her so much. And I got to the point I wouldn't go to school. They laughed at me. Uh, I was smart, and so that was always helpful. And so I would, I would stay at home and do my chores. And then when school was out, because school would be out, I went to St. Simon's School, and school would be out at 3 o'clock. So at 3 o'clock, I would go to school, because then I would have sister out there to myself. 
And uh, oh, it, it meant the world to me because I loved her so much. And for some reason that I will never know, she taught me to drive. And what are you in the eighth grade? You're 12 years old or something like that? She taught me to drive. And I, I did learn to drive. Mommy didn't learn to drive. When, when Gus first got, got hurt, Mommy didn't know how to drive. And so I did. And it's very strange, because I, I don't know why Sister Althea taught me to drive. But I know that she died, I was in Switzerland. And I know she deliberately waited until I was in Switzerland to die. I know that because I know that she didn't want me to be there when she died. And I know that I'm, I'm looking forward to it, actually. I'm, I'm going to go to hell, but I am going to get a day pass to, to heaven. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I am. And because everybody I love is in heaven, so I'm going to get a day pass. And I'm going to go up because I don't know why she taught me to drive. And there are just a couple of other things that I want to know that happened with me. But I know that, and they laughed at me, but, but going, to, going to school didn't make any sense to me until after school was out. And I don't know why they let me, I don't know why she let me do that, but uh, I would. I would go and show, well, here comes Nick. Yeah. I don't, I speak to some of my, my uh, I just talked to Johnita recently, uh, who went to school with me, but uh, I didn't really care. They, they weren't helping me at all. And what helped me was whatever it was that Sister Althea was doing helped me to this point. And I would like to have that conversation with her. That, did that, that doesn't make, I mean, I know you can't, I know theoretically so, you shouldn't be able to have conversations. So school was giving you uh, a lot of factual information, but then when you were able to sit down with your teacher, it was something different. I didn't need, I did not need what they were doing, uh -huh. you know, how this is how, you know, algebra goes or something like that. But I did need to be able to sit and talk with Sister Althea. And I could do that for two hours yeah. because they didn't, they didn't leave to go back to the convent until five o'clock. So I had her to myself from three to five. And that's like a poem? It was like love. And love is like a poem. I I'm, I, I'm, I'm just wondering I, I about what, what particular quality it is that led you into uh, poems instead of some other form? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. She was very proud that I was a writer. And uh, yeah, you know, well, uh, she only died uh, recently, as a matter of fact. Uh, Sister Althea was very, very proud that uh, I was a writer, and she was very proud of my writing. Uh, my grandmother didn't, didn't live to see my writing like that, but uh, Sister Althea did, and of course, Mommy did. And um, that was what mattered to me, I guess. How's your writing changed over the years? Well, I'm, I'm old. And, uh, <laughs> no, it's a good idea being old. Uh, we, we live in a world that you can't be fat or old. And I'm really working very hard on being fat because I need to gain weight. And I weigh 134 pounds. I'm so proud of myself. And I'm trying to gain more weight. My students, <laughs> God bless my students. My, I, I teach a class in, in the evening, five to eight. And my students, are refusing, have ref will continue, I think, to refuse to have class until I eat a muffin and I've been drinking Boost. And uh, I don't know if any of you are drinking Boost, but I drink the chocolate Boost. And they have decided that we will not have class, Nikki, until you eat a muffin. And one of my students brings me a muffin. I have to eat the muffin. And then I have to drink the Boost because they're helping me to gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> They're pushing me, but I hope I gain. Because see, they eat junk food, and I, I just, I would die and go to hell, which I would do it anyway, before I eat, uh, what is that stuff, uh, Kentucky Fried. Oh. Th there's not a white man on earth that can fry chicken. <laughs> <laughs> there just isn't. And, and to see that picture of that guy with, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, what the hell is that? And so, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not gonna do. I, I don't do junk food, and if I did junk food, I could easily gain weight. So that's why they yeah. started to bring me my muffin and my, yeah. I bring my own, well, I used to bring my own. Now LaShonda brings me Boost. She likes uh, strawberry. She brings me strawberry Boost. So. <laughs> Thank you, somebody. <laughs> you have to drink it because they refuse to have class. They, 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 they are saying they'll leave. I believe, I believe they will leave because they won't say a word until after I, they, they watch me. <laughs>
<laughs> so I'm being bullied by my, speaking of bully, I'm being bullied by my class. <laughs> so do you, do you, when you look at, maybe you don't look at your early poems and you look at what you're writing now, how does it feel different? I like my early poems. Uh, they're honest. Uh, the poem Nikki Rosa is the first poem, and it, 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 it's a meaningful poem, Nikki Rosa is, because I had to make up my mind. And I knew that Gus was, something was wrong with Gus. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't understand. I couldn't, it didn't make sense. But something's wrong with anybody who hit somebody. So I had to make a decision. Was I going to let that affect me? And I decided, no, the de my decision is I'm going to be happy. And so that's what that poem says. And all the while, I was quite happy. Actually, I wasn't. And so in a respect, in, in, in certain respect, a good cry responds to Nikki Rosa. But Nikki Rosa was an honest poem because if I hadn't made up my mind to be happy, I would have been crazy. And I didn't want to be crazy. I wanted to take the next step. And I wanted to find somebody to love. And love had to be about something other than what I was seeing. Yeah. yeah. So the poems in this collection, there's so many poems that feel like they're to and about people you love. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the last four in the book, to Maya Angelou. Those are just um, so loving and so warm. Do you have some stories about her? Oh, I have a lot of stories about Maya. What, what was nice about Maya, the reason Maya and I became friends, actually, is that Maya was always nice to my mother. And uh, Maya is, uh, was uh, about 6'2". And uh, I knew Kay Graham. We were talking about that early. Uh, Catherine Graham, they just did the post about her. And Kay was, I don't know, about six feet. You know, they're all tall. And we were all invited to Mount Holyoke. And Mommy was 4'11". And so we all went up, you know, and I invited Mommy. I said, let's go up to Mount Holyoke. You know, it was really cool. And we went up there. And so you got these tall women with their fur coats. And we had Mommy without one. And I thought, no, now when we go home, <laughs> speaking of things you want to do, I said when, when we go, because we're in Cincinnati, and so we go to Cincinnati, the first thing I'm going to do, is, and, and I said that on, on, on Monday, I said, can you take Wednesday off? You know, it was just one of those. And she said, what do you, I said, I need you to do something. And so we did, we went to the fur place, and we picked the, you know, you picked the furs. And I know that, and, and I apologize for all of us that care about minks, and you say, oh, you know, you killed them or whatever. I did. But I wanted my mother. I was never going to have my mother go and see those women again and not have a fur. <laughs> that, was, that was just your basic. But Maya was always nice to mommy. Maya would see mommy at a place. She always was very nice. And, you, you know, you got to like people who are nice to your mother. We didn't see. I saw Kay Graham more than she did. And I saw Ben Bradley more because, uh, ben, because we, we did. Uh, 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 you know, move uh, the journals together. We, mm -hmm. I worked with him, mm -hmm. but uh, she saw Maya a lot. Maya was always kind to my mother, so you had to be nice to her. And I ended up putting those poems in just so whatever young writer is out there for whatever these kind of things mean, I wanted the writers to be able to see writing one thing is not necessarily enough. There are other things to be said. And I have to laugh about Maya because Maya always thought she was a good cook, and I know that I am. And so we had, we 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 backed and forth on 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 who's actually the better cook. She she was a, a not a bad cook, but I was a, a really good cook. And one time I am a good cook. And, but one time Oprah was coming down, and I I think my I, I think my was just in a mood. And so I only live two hours away. She's in Mount uh, in, in Wake Forest. And so she called me and said, you know, oh, why don't you come down? She says, you're always talking about your rack of lamb. Why don't you come down and, and bring a rack of lamb? I said, sure, I'd be happy to, to do that. What's going on? She said, well, Oprah's coming down. I said, OK, I can handle that. And uh, I can. Uh, Oprah doesn't even claim to be a good cook. So we don't even have that as an issue. <laughs> and so I got my, you know, I, I took my leg, got in there, and I, I, I drove down, and I made my rack of lamb. Now, Maya is, is in a wheelchair. And she has some, here, some here, uh, she can't uh, breathe, so she has to be away because, you know, she can't be so close to the, she doesn't want to blow herself up. <laughs> and so she's back here, and I'm, I'm doing my, my rack of lamb. Well, I'd really do a perfect rack of lamb. If any of you cook rack of lamb, I'd do a perfect rack of lamb, which I did, <laughs> you know. Mrs. Clay, who was her, her chef, cook the rest of the dinner. And so Maya didn't want to admit. And I, I said that. I said, this is the best rack of lamb you've ever had. She said, well, it could use a little more salt. <laughs> and I said, she ought to get over it. <laughs> <laughs>
I just had to say that because she knew better. It was perfect. And uh, <laughs> fixed my racket. But we laughed about things. We know we did things like that. And, did you two uh, influence each other's writing? No, I don't. Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, I was writing ahead of Maya, but I don't think a whole lot. I, I think that, that Maya had things she wanted to say and things she wanted to do. And again, I don't, I don't think it was about that. I think it was about personality. Yeah, just, yeah. And uh, her house was a three, was a three story house. And so if you go down and you spend the night, uh, I didn't start to have anything to drink at all until I was in my 30s. <laughs> so, and I still don't like beer. And if I was down with Maya, because Maya, <laughs> Maya killed bourbon. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even, Maya did bourbon. So if you just want to be on her best side, just walk in and say, what's the best bourbon? What's the most expensive bourbon in the world? They would tell you, and you'd take it down and say, I was thinking about your girl, and, gave it. and she'd sit there and drink it. Well, if you sat there and drank it with you, you couldn't drive home because you, <laughs> you, you'd kill yourself. And so I slept in what I then called my room. And Mrs. Mrs. Clay made really good fried chicken, and I was there one night. But see, Maya, and I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, though I, I'm sure her people know, Maya always had a gun, uh, just because of she was, and that's the way her, her house was. So you knew when you went to bed to stay, because I'm upstairs, <laughs> and you knew it would be unwise to come downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but I was reading a book, and I was, wanting a piece of Miss Clay's chicken. And I thought, well, I'll go down. And I had to think, I said, no, I can go down really quietly. Because <laughs> you don't want to get killed over a piece of chicken. <laughs> so I tiptoed down. And the, the, her bedroom is here, but the kitchen is here. And so I was, OK, if I open it, when you open the kitchen, you know, the refrigerator, you know that it's going to be a light. So you have to wonder, now, where is that light going to go? And I opened it, and I grabbed it, closed it, and I listened. <laughs> and then I snuck back upstairs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I, I said, girl, last night I came down and got some chicken. She said, uh-huh. <laughs> I said, I'll never do that again. Uh, but uh, no, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I think we have to stop and get some questions oh, from oh, the sure. audience. Um, and in order to do that, there are people with, mi with microphones, and, and because this is being recorded, you need to use the microphone. It needs to get to you to ask your question. It's so wonderful, Nikki. Thank oh, you so much. Oh, it's been fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mentioned, while they're doing this, I mentioned that Ashley is 94, and uh, I have issues with re remembering, but Ashley's nephew came and got him. He lives in Alsford, and he came and got it because it's cold up there, and he, his, his nephew lives in, in, in uh, Texas, down in, in, in uh, Houston. And they send boxes when you do books, as you, they send boxes. So they sent a box down so that Ashley would sign them, and then Ashley was supposed to send them back and then I was going to sign them. And then we would, you know, and Ashley had a box of books and he signed them all. And, and he forgot why he had done that. And, and he, 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 he goes to church. So on Sunday, that following Sunday, he had these books that he had signed. So he took them to church <laughs> and gave them to everybody. <laughs> I loved it. I thought, yeah, see, if I had done that, they'd have been mad at me. But it's such a lovely, it's such a lovely book, so then they sent them to me, and then they did them the other way so that uh, he wouldn't give them away. <laughs> um, I think there's a question over here. Hi, Mrs. Giovanni. My name is P. Cole, and I would just like to let you know that you were my first introduction to poetry. When my mom, when I was little, my mom used to read me a poem called I See the Moon, the Moon Sees Me, God Bless the Moon, God Bless Me, and so I just wanted to know the inspiration behind that poem, and thank you very much. It's an honor to meet you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Question up, up there. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Miracle. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was, so 
going through time, how has your how has your poetry been influenced by things that have been going on, like socially or just morally? How has your poetry changed with you? Uh, it was, I, I think, you know, of course, I never thought I'd get to the point that I'd say, well, when I was 50. <laughs> but when I was 50, it was influenced by the social climate. And uh, other than the fact that, that, that Trump is a fool, I'm, I'm not influenced at all. <laughs> it, I, I couldn't be less interested because right now, what is interesting is I'm 74, and I think that's really good. And if I live another couple of months, I'll be 75, and I think that's really a good idea. I like growing old and I love space. And the people, many of the people that I love have transitioned. But my job is to find who I love now. And I think I've been, uh, uh, I dedicated this book to Jenny because I think I'd be lost without Jenny. I just, uh, I just don't know what I'd do. If, 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 if Jenny didn't answer the phone, I'd, I really don't know what I'd do. I'd, I'd just be absolutely lost. But then there are other, I'm having now younger people that I love, but I'm not interested. I, I, really, I really don't care. If, if uh, Trump and that fool uh, from, from uh, one of those Koreas shoot each other, I, I couldn't care less. <laughs> it, it, it just doesn't influence. The, the kids do it. The, I'm too old. Somebody had said, you know, oh, you know, are you going to go for the march? I said, hell, I did my marching. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not marching. No, you all go. I think the only thing that I, I really do care about a lot is that I'm really sick of people having something to say about the gay community. Because I just don't see that it's anybody's business who you f I, <laughs> I, I just don't. Excuse me, I'm sorry. No. But other than that, Watching you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm not interested. I think you ought to be able to love who you love because it's hard to love somebody. And I think if you do, you ought to be able to. And I'm tired of people using that as an excuse for hatred. So I'm, 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 I'm definitely uh, in, in favor of that. But. Is there a, a question up there? Uh, there, okay. Nikki, welcome to Michigan from Michigan Writers. I'm wondering at 74, almost 75, why you're still teaching? What does that do for your life? Oh, if I didn't teach, <laughs> I wouldn't have any, I, I wouldn't have a routine. And it's important for me. Uh, I'm a, UD, a university distinguished professor. I love Virginia Tech, first of all, and, and I, I always have. It's, it's my first real job. <laughs> it is. But I just, about two months ago now, I finally got, and this is what I'm sharing, an agent. I have gone through my entire writing life without an agent. A lot of people didn't know that. I never had an agent because I never thought that there would be anybody as interested in my work as I am. And <laughs> I am not. And my good friend, and I love him so much, Kwame Alexander, came up to see me because Kwame is like my literary son, and I do, I love him so much. And he was worried when he heard that I had breast cancer. And no matter what Kwame is doing, he just comes. I mean, it, it, it makes you cry. And, and I just, I, I opened my eyes, and there he was. And it's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I, I understand you are having, I said, Kwame, you have things to do. And he said, yeah, I had to be here, which I just love him for that. And I said, well, maybe you can do me a favor because I need, I need a favor. And he said, what's that? I said, I think I need an agent because I have three books that I want done before I pass, before I transition. And one is with a, my good friend Kay Graham. I want to do, Kay is, is white and I'm obviously black. And we both do children's literature. And I want to do a book with her like what we're doing here on stage because we keep saying that black women and white women don't get along and don't talk and don't have anything in common and it's not true. Kay and I have a lot in common and I want us to be a part of that. And, and Kay has agreed. I needed somebody to, to, do, to do that. Make Me Rain does not have an agent. And so I am, am willing, uh, because Make Me Rain will get, that will be money. Kay and I don't have a money book, but Make Me Rain will get money. And uh, you know, I mean, that's the business, so I, I do know the business. So I thought if I could offer that, and I have a, a poem, called a library and it's going to be illustrated. And I have agreed that a library could go 
a library and, and, and make me rank and go, if we can find a way to have Kay and me to do the book together. Because I think it's just the right book to do at the right time, that two women sitting and talking about what we, what we read to our children, what we read to each other, what we've come back to read, what we would take into space. And uh, Kay also uh, drink champagne. I'm allowed two glasses of champagne a day uh, when I'm, not, not now because I'm alone, nobody is, is, is with, Jenny's not with me, but when Jen's with me, I can have two glasses because then if I get lost, she'll see to it, I get back to the hotel or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we're, you know, I now have, I now have an agent and I'm so, excited about having it. I, I don't know if, it, it, if you have, but I'm so excited to have it. Her name is Ariel. And uh, I'm just so excited about Ariel. And she writes, well, she writes Jenny because I don't, uh, I don't do uh, those things on the yeah, phone. Yeah, the phone. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so she writes Jenny and, and then Jenny tells me. So I'm excited about where the career is going to go. And you say, why do I teach? Well, first of all, you have to love 25 students who sit there and say, we're not going to have class until you eat a muffin and drink Boost. <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just do. And like anybody, I, I, I need to be loved. And, and, and I want to be loved, and I want to love. You know, I, I say that when I, when I first started class, because I, I think it's only fair. I'm, I'm at Virginia Tech, and we are. Uh, uh, a conservative area, and I say to my students, you know, I hate Donald Trump, so if you cannot bear hearing that every now and then, I'll see to it that you get another writing class. Because I don't think you should have to sit there and hear me say, what a son of a bitch I think he is. And, well, that's only fair. And, and so I want to get you out of my class, because this is what I know. Is that, that's fair? Of course it's, it's fair. fair. And so, you know, it's that kind of thing. But, I love it. I, I, I get up on Tuesday. I, 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 I teach on Tuesday, 5 to 8. I teach in the evening. And to know that I'm, that I'm going to talk to a bunch of youngsters and they're going to have something to say or something to ask me. I had to go see, now we said we weren't going to talk about it, but I had to go see the Black Panther because they kept wanting to talk about it and wanting to talk about it. And I hadn't seen it. But I was trying to explain to them, I haven't seen I grew up in segregation, so the last movie that I saw <laughs> before a whole month was uh, The Godfather Part Two. <laughs> so that shows, you know, where it was. And then I, I finally, I broke down, I, I saw The Black Panther, but I saw, uh, what did I see? Uh, 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 the Agatha Christie, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Yeah. I went with a bunch of friends, but I sat there, and I was so glad I don't snore, because I sat there <laughs> and absolutely went to sleep. And everybody keeps saying, well, why do you dislike movies? I, I dislike the segregation. So I'm trying to get over that. I didn't go to sleep on the, on the Black Panther, but uh, I did go. So Tuesday, that's, I, after I eat my muffin and, and drink my boost, we're going to discuss the Black Panther. We so. eat. We each went to see the Black Panther with our grandchildren. With our grandchildren, yes. yeah. <laughs> Separately. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see where right my granddaughter was explaining why it was important. <laughs> um, I don't know where we are on time. There's a lady here. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Mrs. Giovanni, thank you so much for coming. The question I have is about loving what is right now. What poet and what poem are you loving right now? Well, I love, <laughs> for obvious reasons, a good cry. But what I really am, what excites me is, is what you don't know, to be honest, because it's, it's I've written it. It, 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 it's, it's in Make Me Rain. And uh, I, I think that I'm just lucky or whatever it is. And probably some of the writers in the room, we have writers in, in this room. You know how it is. You, you finish this. I'm very proud of this. Uh, book, I really am, mm -hmm. and I love what I've done, and I think that I've done a, a decent job, and, and I'm glad about that, but you're always into your next, what did you just, uh, what did you just do, and so I'm into what I'm just doing, and I really like what I'm just, uh, what I'm just doing, so by the time it gets out, if I'm lucky, I will have started another book, if I'm lucky. <laughs> we have a question up here, up in the balcony. 
Thank you for coming. Uh, my question at the beginning, you were talking about poetry isn't emotional, and I'm not a writer, but it seems to me that poetry is emotional, and it seems there's been a lot of emotion tonight. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I think you're right with your heart. I, I, I have a couple of good friends, uh, one who is a brilliant novelist, actually, Tony Morrison. We were talking about that today because I took a picture. Tony likes perch, and I was eating perch for lunch, so we took a picture. I'm going to send it to her and say, <laughs> I, I was thinking about you, girl, you know. But um, I think that the novelists have emotional thing. You can't talk to novelists while they're writing, you know, because it takes them so long. They're into their whole you know, their whole thing, and, and I don't think the poets are like that. I think we write our poems, and then we either like it or we decide it's no good. When I decide it's no good, I erase it. Uh, I don't try to keep it, you know, you said, no, I don't keep notes like that. If I can't remember it, then I, I let it go, and then I start back. I have a, a, a line, though, that I'm working on that I don't mind sharing, uh, if, if I may say that. And I just woke up in the middle of the night, and it says, somebody heard my mother crying crying in the middle of the road. Somebody heard my mother crying, crying in the middle of the road. And I haven't decided, I know it's a song, it's not a poem. And I know it's going to go. And I'm wondering why, I wonder why my mother, I, I don't know right now why mommy was crying in the middle of the road. And so that's been with me for a while. I haven't forgotten it and I can't go any place else with it. And I keep telling Jenny, well, if I could just have one more glass of champagne, maybe I could finish this, <laughs> this poem. But she's not allowing that right now, so I, I'm struggling with it. But you, it, it is your heart. And there's something, I don't, I don't know. I don't know it's because I had a mastectomy. I, I don't know why mommy's in the middle of the road. I don't know what she's trading off for my right breast. <laughs> I know that she, if she could, she would. Am I making? There's a reason that she's standing there negotiating with somebody. And I have to think it's about me because I'm all that's left. There isn't, there isn't anybody. And uh, in, in, in the Giovannis, all of the Giovannis are gone. The Watsons are pretty much gone. There, there, are, there are only two Watsons left. So there has to be a reason she's in the middle of the road but I don't know why right now. I think that's an absolutely beautiful place to leave things for tonight because you've got your poem and you're skating out on your poem and it's going somewhere and you don't know where yet. <laughs> but we do need to quit. So thank you so much, Nikki. It's just thank you.